Hello everyone. Thank you for taking our time and joining us. Um, COVID was the most Google word term in India in 2021. In first half of 22, it was inflation. In second half, it was recession. And what is it today? Chat GPT. Point being, from vaccines to macro concerns to technological advancements, we all have read varied narratives and even varied interpretations in the last couple of years. Our job as investors is to stay calm and choose first principles above all else. In our annual conference today, we will look back and rewind to what happened, take stock of things as they are today, and finally look forward to the year 2023 that lies ahead. Welcome to our annual investor meet. We are excited and privileged to have each one of you with us today. Um, please use the chat box for questions, suggestions, and feedback. Um, I'll shortly invite our CEO, Kalpain Parekh, to address us this evening. After Kalpain, we will also hear from Vineet Sambre, our equities head, and Sandeep Yadav, our fixed income head. Post which, we will discuss the questions that you've uh, given it to us. And please use the live chat box as well while we are speaking uh, this evening. So without further ado, over to the man who's been building DSP every day and night, Kalpain Parekh. Thanks, uh, Ankita. And uh, first of all, thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Thank you for uh, trusting your hard-earned money to us. And there are a lot of uh, distributors and advisors also who have joined. So thank you for being a part of this journey with DSP over the last uh, two and a half plus decades. Uh, we take uh, this responsibility of managing your money with a lot of seriousness. And I felt, uh, along with my team, uh, it would be a very uh, useful, uh, you know, annual occasion where we come and talk to you about how we see the investment world. We share with you our simple principles of uh, managing money uh, in a world which is uh, extremely complex and, um, you know, give you an update about uh, our thoughts, about our performances, about how your portfolios are doing. Uh, I also, you know, have invited a uh, few of my senior colleagues uh, in this interaction this evening. And uh, we would be very happy to receive uh, many questions from all of you so that uh, we can have a meaningful dialogue after we share some of our thoughts. So I want to start the year, uh, start the session with uh, the scorecard for, uh, for the last year, uh, which was uh, extremely interesting with all the ups and downs. Um, in terms of how uh, DSP and DSP products have done, I want to start with the first uh, observation that, you know, we have seen a year where interest rates finally, after a long period of time, uh, in, in the rest of the world as well as in India started rising and um, generally when interest rates rise, uh, you know, debt funds uh, demonstrate fluctuations in their NAVs uh, if they are holding long duration bonds. Thankfully, we uh, have been very conservative since the last uh, 18 months or two years um, when interest rates had gone down, you know, like India's repo rate had gone down to 4%. So we have been maintaining very low uh, duration or low portfolio maturities. We, were, we have been owning uh, shorter tenor bonds uh, in our debt, debt funds. And now, uh, after almost uh, nine months of um, you know, constant um, uh, raise or hike in rates by Reserve Bank, as well as uh, bond yields going up, we have started increasing the portfolio maturities. Uh, this, in a way, now enables our funds to earn the uh, higher YTMs or higher yields that are now available for us. And we'll talk a lot more about it uh, during the course of the evening. Uh, our flagship equity funds, which are also some of our oldest and you know fairly well-known fund where a lot of you have invested money with us, um, made the FlexiCap equity fund, the MidCap fund, and our dynamic asset allocation fund, which we have also encouraged in the last uh, two, three years for investors to participate, haven't done as well as uh, that would make us happy. And... Um, very shortly, uh, we need my colleague will you know take you through uh, our thoughts and uh, what are we doing about these funds and the performance. Uh, we uh, you know completely humbly accept that these funds need to do better. They have been our stellar funds over long periods of time, but the last eighteen months have not been the best for us. And we'll share some of our thoughts in terms of giving confidence to you how we are uh, managing these portfolios. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of our other uh, very well. Uh, recognized and funds where we have large number of investors, our small cap fund, our tax saver fund, our US flexible equity fund, they have done reasonably well. They have navigated these fluctuations in, uh, you know, the small cap universe in the last year or two, the larger volatility in the US market, you know, these funds have done reasonably well. In fact, uh, I'll just call out that this is also a phase where 
a uh, lot of money post covid went into all types of small cap stocks and uh, you know many investors have seen um, uh, these stocks correcting aggressively and in that construct i always tell investors that um, small cap funds whether dsp or you know overall from the fund industry they've done a very credible job of sticking to uh, the quality bucket of the largest universe of small cap companies and which is why they are able to sustainably create a uh, significant compounding over a period of time so you know uh, i'm we are happy that these funds have done well our tax saver fund uh, continues to remain a consistent fund enabling investors to plan their tax and uh, you know uh, achieve their goals of compounding so we've had a mixed bag in terms of some of our core funds not doing that well and some of them are doing reasonably well and we will answer a lot of questions around that uh, we increased uh, our range of passive funds index as well as etf across uh, both the asset classes debt and equity uh today we have uh, you know three funds in fixed income across um, a five year seven year and a 10 year bucket for uh, uh, investing in a passive manner and uh, in equity uh, we have the basic range of nifty nifty next nifty equal weight uh, we introduced last year a very interesting uh, fund on the mid cap index uh, using quality as a filter and uh, very recently we launched our uh, uh, nifty uh, you know bank uh, etf Uh, we also have a liquid etf uh, which uh, which enables a lot of people who uh, are very active in terms of stock pick and whenever they book profits they need to park that money so we you know completed a reasonably wide range on uh, both debt and equity uh, in our passive and many more will follow uh, over a period of time uh, we also strengthened our investment team uh, we we recognized you know how the world is evolving uh, how um, uh, data technology blended with fundamental rule based investing Uh, can create a very robust uh, investment process to deliver uh, value to our investors so across our uh, equity fixed income uh, credit and uh, uh, quant function we've added new and younger talent uh, which um, gives us more confidence to navigate the market volatility in times ahead um, our large cap fund the top funded fund one of our uh, again very old fund uh, was a flagship fund uh, generally over the last decade hasn't done well we've made uh, some decisive changes there we've added Uh, we brought in a new fund manager and uh, we introduced a significantly high active share in the portfolio which means the portfolio deviates uh, extensively from nifty or the top 100 stocks and um, you know typically in the large cap universe alpha has been challenged a lot of you would have been reading that many large cap funds are not able to beat the benchmarks including ours and um, uh, when we analyze we realize that if we own more and more of the benchmark and then on top of it there is a 2% management fee it is very difficult mathematically to achieve that outcome so we introduced uh, or, or rather we we run the portfolio with reasonably high active share we've communicated few weeks back about that and um, we are confident that uh, you know in the course of next few quarters um, we will keep our investors uh, more updated and uh, the performance will uh, come back in terms of uh, beating the benchmark um, we did something very interesting beginning of the year the, the start of 2022 Uh, coincided with significant volatility in a theme globally which had done very well for last 10 years which was you know the theme of innovation and technology so uh, i remember in 2021 uh, the best performing portfolios were global portfolios and uh, global tech companies and you know global semiconductor companies and so on and so forth but we recognize that probably this uh, space is uh, uh, also at a 10 year high i mean hindsight it was uh, a high Uh, because in the last nine uh, to twelve months, uh, that space has seen significant correction. But and at that point in time, we didn't know whether it's going to correct tomorrow or one year later. But we recognize that uh, these are good companies, but they're getting priced uh, more uh, uh, aggressively, or you know they are becoming very expensive. So uh, uh, you know by the time we launched the fund, the first twenty percent correction had happened, which gave us a lot more confidence to bring the product to the market. and then we uh, uh, you know introduced the fund and encouraged our investors only to invest via sips and we are very happy to say that over the last 12 months while many more investors have joined the fund but 72% of investors have uh, in- invested in this theme only via sips and you know the beauty of the the, the simple concept of sip is such that uh, in a category where there is lot of fluctuation and you know initially you see prices or nav is falling uh, you have an opportunity to acquire more units so Uh, if someone has done a thousand rupee SIP, so twelve hundred rupees uh, invested in the last twelve months, um, the entire portfolio is actually appreciated by nine percent versus the NAV being down by five because all through the last twelve months um, the NAVs were falling. You were able to acquire higher units. 
So using, uh, I'm just highlighting about this because that was one of our most prominent product where, uh, you know, a large number of investors had joined the fund. Uh, overall, we added uh, three and a half lakh investors uh, to the DSP family. And uh, uh, we've continued to increase our commitment in terms of uh, publishing uh, more, uh, uh, you know, valuable insights, which can help you as investors and distributors to, you know, interpret markets, to understand our approach, uh, to, to, you know, get aligned to what we are doing. Uh, via various uh, uh, investment insights, which we publish at various uh, frequency, whether it is Netra or Transcript Navigator. And we also are uh, in the, uh, you know, at the moment of launching a very uh, simple and uh, important uh, digital tool, which can guide investors in terms of, you know, what should be the asset allocation, keeping in mind your risk profile, as well as how market opportunities are looking like. Now, uh, so far, I've, I've, you know, spoken very formally, and I'll break the monotony a little bit. Uh, by just showing something which became very viral in the last few days. And uh, I, I don't know who this young person is, but uh, uh, we've given the credit in terms of uh, his handle. But uh, he speaks uh, uh, for just a minute and a half, but he actually conveys what are uh, what is the behavior of markets uh, generally in the last few years where it has been very choppy. It, it has been moving up, up and down because of good news, bad news, good events, bad events. Uh, but he explains this in a very uh, you know funny way so i will just break the monotony by play wo niche chala gaya to maine bech diya jaise hi becha wo upar chala gaya to maine le liya lekin wo niche chala gaya mujhe laga dobara upar aayega to maine aur le liya lekin wo niche hi jata raha to maine bech diya jaise hi becha to wo upar chala gaya mujhe laga is bar dobara niche aayega to maine nahi liya lekin wo upar hi jata raha to maine le liya जैसे ही लिया वो नीचे चला गया मुझे लगा इस बार तो पक्का ऊपर जाएगा तो मैंने और ले लिया लेकिन हुआ उल्टा वो और नीचे चला गया तो मैंने बेच दिया सो यू नो दिस इज एग्जैक्टली हाउ मार्केट की फ्लक्चुएटिंग वाइल दिस इज अ वेरी फनी एंड एंटरटेनिंग वे ऑफ एग्जेजरेटिंग द मूवमेंट ऑफ मार्केट बट मोर ऑफन दिस इज अ डायलेमा फॉर मेनी इन्वेस्टर्स हुए लास्ट टू ईयर्स बिकॉज लास्ट टू ईयर इनिशियली सीन अ राइजिंग मार्केट आफ्टर कोविड and then we started seeing a lot of fluctuations because um post covid we had the ukraine russia war and then we had rise in interest rates everywhere we had the uh, uh, you know we had commodity prices going up a lot of disruptions and market started fluctuating so uh, what happens is market fluctuate and, and i want to use this example to highlight that we should not worry about that it is a feature of markets or asset prices whether equities or bonds and hence equity and debt funds to fluctuate in the near to medium term Uh, but as long as in the long term the direction of the market is up uh, as investors we need to take advantage of these fluctuations and not become victims of these fluctuations and what tends to happen many times is uh, if we watch these fluctuations too closely and uh, you know end up buying or selling at uh, the wrong end of the extremes it creates a significant gap in the behavior as well as the performance that we achieve uh, carl richards is a very uh, you know respected um, author who's written a book called behavior gap and this is a very defining picture which actually conveys decades of learnings in one picture itself and he says that you know many times a stock or a mutual fund may deliver x percent return but uh, let's say that it delivers 12 percent return but investors end up earning only 5 to 6 percent out of that 12 and this gap is actually the gap of behavior uh, this is a gap which um, uh, arises because of constant reaction to short term market fluctuations and uh, too much of activity or uh, buying probably at a high or selling at a low and vice versa and this is a gap uh, not prevalent only with uh, individual investors we are also at times victims of this at times we also get uh, you know swayed by uh, changing data points by uh, you know changing trends so uh, we are also you know uh, at times not immune to some of these uh, nuances and which is why we are upfront highlighting that this is a gap that we need to be aware of as uh, money managers ourselves as well as you when you make that investment so much so that let me give you an example we have a fund which is now almost 26 years old uh, this is our oldest fund it's called the dsp flexicap fund uh, over its entire history it has you know earned around uh, 17 to 18% uh, long term returns it has delivered 3 4% extra over the benchmark uh, it has compounded at very healthy rates of return however you'll be surprised to know that not even 26 investors have stayed put in this entire journey now there could be various reasons we are always happy that if investors come in at at, at nav lows make money get out fulfill their objectives and goals 
but many times investors get out because of volatility and uh, inability to acknowledge or accept that volatility but it's very ironical that the fund returns are very good but very few people are able to uh, take advantage of that and uh, you know which is why it's very important to have uh, some uh, simple hacks or simple rules or simple uh, concept that you should be aware of today's um, uh, con- you know conversation with you and we will do many more over the course of time is an attempt by all of us at dsp to share some of these rules that we have learned and i hope i'm able to express that in a language which is you know uh, very easy for all of you to understand uh, uh, so so what are the rules that really matter uh, uh, in, in in the game of investing in bonds as well as in equities uh, you know remember that interest rates normally in india fluctuate between 5% to 9% at large over the last 20 years when interest rates are at 5% at a low which is where they went a few quarters back generally they start uh, turning from there and start rising uh, and then you know there are phases when they rise and they go up to 8 8 and a half 9 percent and then they stabilize there and then then start coming down today we are at seven and a half we are somewhere in between we are at average but we don't see that they may probably go back to eight and a half nine because for the last 10 years the government and the reserve bank have worked very closely together to bring inflation down so uh, my colleague sandeep will speak a little bit more about that but just keep the, keep in mind that the boundary conditions of uh, fixed income as an asset class, bonds as an asset class, is interest rates fluctuate in this band. And hence, you should know at what part of the band should you decide uh, to invest more in bonds or less in bonds. Similarly, for equity, you know, very often we look at the price of the market, that the Nifty is at 17,000 or Sensex is at 60,000. That's the price of the market. And hence, it is at an all-time high. Like our age, every day reaches an all-time high. But that information has no uh, uh, predictive power or uh, input value. What is important if you want to really measure uh, equity as an asset class is to look at valuations of uh, that asset class and not the price of that asset class. And valuation means that how do you value uh, the 50 companies of Nifty or the 500 companies of Nifty where you are investing. Uh, If we take the last uh, 25 year history of uh, Indian markets, uh, in bad times, uh, the entire pool of uh, Nifty companies get valued at 12 times of their profit. So if they are making 100 rupees of profit, they get a val- price of 1200. And in euphoric or good times, they go up to 24 times of the same 100 rupee of profit. So broadly, that is the range. Uh, there was an exception during COVID when you know the profit pools uh, stopped for a few quarters. So that 24 became 35 or so. But that was a simple once in a century aberration. So ignore that. But what what it means is. If you invest in any asset class at a higher value of what its uh, uh, you know uh, core is, you in the future will earn lesser returns. And if you invest when the value is cheaper, the future returns will be better. Uh, today we are somewhere at around 19 or 20. The average equity valuation, which is reflected in price to earning ratio, is uh, around 17 or 18 times of the profits. So currently, the valuation of all the Nifty companies is. Uh, 20 uh, times of the profits they make as of today. Now, these profits keep on rising and hence the P keeps coming down. But if stock prices rise very fast, fast, then the P's will go up. So typically when, uh, you know, markets go in a frenzy because of various reasons and once in six, seven years, these frenzies keep happening. The valuations become very high. And then there are times when there is panic, there are bad news, there are bad events, there are bad economic cycles, the valuations will come down. But 12 and 24 are typically at the extreme. Why am I highlighting this is while they will come, you know, very rarely, we as investors should not make mistakes at this extreme. As long as we are in the middle and we stay invested for the long term, we will achieve our goals, we will make money. But if we misbehave towards the extreme, which means when they are very expensive towards 24 times and we we put more money in the asset class, then the future returns will be lesser. If markets go to other extreme of 12 times to their profits and we get out because, you know, on that day, the last one year return will look very poor. And if we get out and and then we, we are again making bad mistakes. So these are the behaviors that we need to avoid. So just keep these two uh, ranges broadly in your mind. And uh, that should, you know, help you decide where we are. And let me give some examples of what these extremes can mean. Uh, in the year uh, 2000, Uh, There was a tech bubble globally and in India. Some of the best companies in India went up to as high as 70, 80, 100 times on uh, price to earning multiple Uh, and likewise globally. And the overall market was at 2017. Since that day till today, the return of Nifty uh, is 13%. uh, And uh, bonds have returned roughly around 9 to 10% in the same period. So the difference between equity and debt 
uh, is not very large. Though three to four percent is reasonably large return over a twenty-two year period, but it's still not very large because valuations are very high. And one one solution to higher valuations is actually longer time horizons. Uh, what I'm highlighting here is that bond yields also end up, you know, delivering decent returns. And gold as an asset class delivered eleven percent in the same twenty-two years, so not too bad, not too uh, far away from uh, equity. But in the next four years, uh, there was a you know global tech uh, meltdown. Then you know all markets came down. There was an economic uh, slowdown. Three four years of zero return in equity. Everyone got out of equity by that time. No one was interested. In two thousand four, the same twenty seven P had come down to around eleven or twelve. And if if someone had invested in Nifty that time, since then till today, in eighteen years, the returns are eighteen percent CAGR. And versus that, bonds have delivered seven percent. So now you see the gap is very wide. And gold as an asset class has done twelve percent. Uh, and um, if you had blended gold and Indian equities and bonds and international equities together, when when markets were very expensive in two thousand, uh, your long term return would have been twelve percent. Um, not too bad. So this is the power of you know asset allocation when when some asset classes go towards an extreme. So what is the takeaway of all these data points? Is that uh, you know asset allocation does work. Mix asset classes depending on your time horizon. And uh, your appetite towards fluctuations and volatility, and at all points in time, try to invest in what is less popular and what is relatively available at good valuations, whether equities or bonds or stocks or uh, global stocks or sometimes even precious metals as an asset class. Uh, so these are some rules that we need to be aware of, uh, not just for 2023, but these are rules which are generally timeless. They work 75, 80 percent of times. There are no rules which will work 100 percent of times. But if if we get these right for You know, most of the time we are home. So when interest rates are low, invest in funds with lower maturities. Uh, uh, if you are a debt fund investor, typically one year, two year maturity. So these are low duration funds or short term funds. When interest rates are high, invest in funds with higher maturity. So this will be medium term funds or long duration funds, actively managed bond funds. Also, when generally interest rates rise a lot, uh, stock markets fall and valuations come down. It is also a good time to add hybrid funds in the portfolio. On the other hand, for equity as an asset class, not prices, but when valuations are high, generally twenty times and above, it is better to be more in debt funds, also in hybrid funds which have a higher component of fixed income and protection and safety, and a little bit of precious metals because volatility, uh, you know, uh, it ensures in absorbing some volatility and giving you more steady returns. And when valuations are low, or by all means, increase exposure to equity funds and uh, hybrid funds. Where are we today? Today, interest rates are higher. So we should take advantage of fixed income and bonds, and equity valuations are not very expensive. So you know this was a worry one year back, but the flat returns of last one year uh, have brought valuations, um, you know, made them reasonable, but they are still not very cheap. They are slightly expensive than what their long term averages are, and hence this is a better time to have portfolios which have a, a meaningful exposure to equity along with fixed income and maybe global equity as well as uh, bonds. I'll give you some examples of this. You know, it's not just uh, English and words, but just look at these data points. And I, I shared that in 2000, generally equity valuations are very high. So the purple line is the return of Nifty uh, since then, uh, uh, 12.5% CAGR over the last 20 years, 22 years. Instead, if you had done 35% in Nifty, 35% in global equities, and the balance 15% each in uh, gold and uh, sovereign bonds or you know even fixed deposits. uh the the return you would have earned is 11 and 1/2 but with with much lesser fluctuation and much lesser volatility and the right side of the graph highlights that so if you take periods like um, 2002 the purple line had fallen by almost 45% whereas the yellow line had fallen only by 20% so much lesser fluctuations likewise in 2008-9 when the global financial crisis happened the purple line fell by 55% and the orange line the the yellow line fell by only 25% so it cushions volatility so at market extremes asset allocation becomes very important be aware of that there are few more you know uh, good rules that i would just like to share with all of you before we proceed further uh, always ask right questions don't blindly uh, bow to authority or uh, uh, blindly you know uh, uh, rely on headlines or data points and uh, take investment decisions and i'll give you some of my uh, experiences around that i remember uh, in 2000 uh, the year 2000 when uh, technology funds were being launched and uh, there was a lot of hype that indian tech companies will become very large they will become champions and they'll beat the rest of the companies in the world um, and hence we should invest in tech i have made those mistakes i have you know invested i have even sold some of these funds 
um, but without realizing that you know sometimes the stories don't work and you blindly followed whatever you know experts mentioned since then till today in 22 years these technology funds overall have grown by only 6.8% and a simple uh, debt fund or a sovereign bond would have won 7% something similar happened in 2008 when there was a story of a uh, great infrastructure build out uh, you know uh, our infrastructure needs uh, versus china were very you know similar but uh, but we were almost at 10% infra versus what china was or rest of the world was which meant that a lot of growth will come by uh, investing in infrastructure as a sector and companies so great stories uh, great narratives eventually the returns earned were only 6.9 again less than fixed income now these are two extreme points that i'm using we are not in such extremes right now but i'm using them to just highlight that do not Uh, just uh, buy into stories. Always ask questions. Always, you know, uh, challenge that. Okay, in this story, what can go wrong? What is the risk? And is this story already there in the price? Because if it is already in the price, you will not make returns in the future, or you will make lesser returns. Also, remember, future is not easy to predict. Um, uh, future is highly unpredictable in today's world. Things keep changing very fast. Economic cycles are changing fast. Uh, macro variables are changing very fast. Uh, so don't rely only on long term uh, forecast and uh, you know predictions uh, you are you know dealing with hard earned money uh, be more discerning in terms of how to take those decisions have right advisors you know read the right information and take those decisions i'll give you a few examples um, two years back uh, no, no one felt that interest rate cycle globally and in india will turn everyone felt that that one you know one decade a uh, journey of interest rates remaining low will continue uh inflation started coming back all experts economists central bankers said that no this inflation is transitory it will not last for long and uh, you know inflation shot up and today ironically we are seeing more inflation in, in the developed world uh, as much as what emerging markets used to have so india is worrying less about inflation and japan and uk and us are worrying more about inflation thankfully our inflation has started coming down and is much better managed and much more in control but the point i'm making is you would have read so many headlines like this but uh, even experts most of the times get this wrong so instead of going on prediction seek evidence not just use look for data look for guidance and here we are making an attempt as a company to you know give you inputs so we have over the last uh, one year created lot of uh, uh, investment inside properties like netra like transcript like report card like converse which help you read understand and uh, uh, you know analyze information and data and you know blend that with communication of our products that at this point in time what products make sense and lastly many investors ask us that okay i have money how do i mix and match what should be my asset allocation so that's where we we launched a navigator which is released once every 3 months which captures all our insights and we very transparently highlight to you uh, two other rules that i want to you know leave with all of you uh, never or pay never buy a story which is you know at very expensive valuations so i i you know highlighted earlier that and these are the you know uh, nav visualizations that the tech fund that i spoke of um, the nav is fell and it took 22 years for them to come back and even match the return of a simple debt fund and the same with uh, you know uh, infrastructure as a story and a theme here we have given an example of one of our funds only which was very popular at that point in time uh, which uh, almost our after 14 years also has not been able to meet fixed income because um, the cycle that time was so uh, crazy and you know a lot of stories were coming out so always uh, especially with theme funds don't get carried away because we've observed uh, even 2 years back there was a lot of you know demand for technology funds and tech stocks because they were rising if you see this um, uh, purple line here uh, which was a very sharp rise from uh, almost uh, you know a five times rise a 300 to 400% movement in uh, navs of tech funds and everyone got carried away and after that we had a sharp correction so just be conscious of that we have to be conscious of that it's not something i'm telling on only you we as money managers also are conscious of these lastly um volatility has increased but time horizons cannot be shorter the only way we can take advantage of volatility uh, is by having a longer time horizon so this is a nice uh, uh, you know a story that um, uh, larry fink who who is the ceo of the largest fund on earth and who was also blackrock was a partner with dsp for the for, for 10 years uh, so he was having a dinner with one of the largest sovereign wealth funds and uh, the investors uh, told him that our objective of, of our money is multi generational uh, we are investing this money for the next generations of our country so that you know their future needs are taken care of and then uh, larry fink asked uh, him that okay so how do you measure the performance of the managers with whom you give money so one of the manager is us also because we manage money for some of these sovereign wealth funds and uh, the answer was quarterly 
So there is a huge mismatch if you see between time horizon that uh, one needs to bring to the table and the indoor endurance to live through short term volatility. Most of us end up measuring uh, data points on a short uh, one year or one quarter basis. Whereas the needs for our money are uh, over a few decades, and that is where long-term compounding happens. Uh, uh, it is also a fact that there are 2,000 books, you know, written about how Warren Buffett has become wealthy and created wealth and achieved long-term compounding. But uh, none of them are, you know, the only takeaway from all these books uh, is about his style, what he likes, what he doesn't like. But very few really highlight and underline that he has been investing consistently for three quarters of a century, 75 years of uh, you know, deploying capital in good companies and compounding money. And um, uh, which is why it's very important that uh, we choose the right funds, the right philosophies, the right managers, and then devote time to it. So I think these are some thoughts that I had about, um, you know, how the year has been for us, how we see the future. Uh, volatility will continue. Uh, what are the rules that we uh, keep for ourselves and, um, uh, you know, in, in the way we manage money. But I would now like to invite uh, our head of fixed income, we need to talk about uh, very quickly about uh, equity markets, our views, and more importantly, what are we doing in our mid-cap fund and flexi-cap fund from a fund performance perspective. So over to you, Vinny. Uh, thank you, Kalpain. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome all of you. Very nice to be here and talking to all the investors. Uh, thanks, uh, Kalpain, for uh, simplifying uh, the complex subject. I will just try to take over from where you left. Um, so, uh, broadly in terms of uh, uh, my presentation uh, to you guys, uh, it is uh, more about um, the long term, uh, long term way of, you know, looking at uh, equities broadly and uh, also, uh, you know, Kalpain actually alluded to how, uh, you know, equities needs to be looked at uh, really, uh, you know, uh, with a very long term uh, uh, aspect and, you know, from our own perspective, what we have observed, uh, you know, looking at uh, the markets for many years, uh, you know, markets have gone through short term uh, issues. Uh, there are many problems which occurred, Lehman crisis, COVID crisis. But in the long term, what is it that matters as far as equity is concerned is, uh, you know, what we have sort of tried to put here in the uh, first uh, chart. So if, you know, one, you know, if you look at the uh, top chart here, uh, is it uh, visible, Kalpain? Yeah, your the chart is visible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, if one focuses on this top chart, what uh, has been the most important factor for the equities, if we look at the last, let's say, tw 29 years, uh, has been the uh, earnings of the corporate India. So if we look at the earnings of corporate India, it has grown at a CAGR of 11.4%. And in the same time period, we have Sensex, uh, which has returned 9.1%, uh, which means that, uh, you know, through uh, the uh, periods of good time, bad time, the markets have seen correction, the market has seen uh, exuberant moves on the upside. But over a long term, what really uh, tends to matter is the earnings and markets tend to catch up. So if we uh, also the other part is if we just try to look at the phase, um, uh, you know, during the Lehman crisis uh, here, you know, the trough which the market has seen in the year 2008, when one zooms out and looks at the 25, 29, 30 years history, this looks so small in the overall context. But remember when we had gone through that period, uh, you know, it was a major drawdown. We had seen our own funds, microcap fund had seen a drawdown of 75%. Uh, which was a massive drawdown and, uh, you know, it was uh, chaotic. Uh, people were concerned what will happen to the money. But when we actually, uh, you know, zoom out and see the long term uh, picture from where uh, we left, um, you know, this uh, looks a very small. Sorry, so just once. So, uh, sorry for this. So, if we if we look at the uh, you know long term picture, you know this actually looks a very small event in the overall context. So, which means that uh, you know uh, I think in the short term you will have a uh, lot of uh, uh, you know issues. You will have accidents. You will have problems, uh, which is part and parcel of uh, the markets, which is part and parcel of our life. But uh, what really matters is the earnings potential of the corporate India, which one has to focus on. 
and that is what drives uh, the overall market valuations uh, in the long term. Uh, the second chart below also suggests that there is uh, no linearity in the earnings growth. So if one again uh, focuses on the period, uh, let's say between 2000, uh, 1997 and 2004, uh, the earnings of corporate India grew by just 1% and index also didn't, uh, you know, give any return. So this was a very painful phase in a way wherein, uh, you know, uh, uh, earnings didn't grow, the returns also didn't come about as far as equities are concerned. But then, uh, you know, it really caught up uh, in the phase since 2003 to 2008 when the earnings staggered at 25% and the index also staggered at a massive 40%. So whatever was really uh, not captured uh, in this phase of 97 to 2004 actually got compensated very quickly uh, uh, in the period between 2004 to 2009. And beyond that, what have we experienced? Uh, we've seen that uh, you know since 2008 to 2018, the earnings uh, for corporate India has again uh, been a low single digit 5% and uh, the markets have also uh, risen at uh, similar CAGR into, uh, at around 8%. Uh, so now what is uh, the outlook going forward? Uh, already we have seen the last two years earnings has infected. We have seen a sound 24% uh, you know, earnings CAGR and we hope that uh, you know, with, the, uh, uh, with the reforms which uh, India has seen with the economic revival which uh, we will see going forward and anyways from the COVID lows as we recover as an economy I think we will have a sound earnings growth so I think uh, from the long-term perspective what really matters uh, maybe not the interest rate inflation um, uh, the uh, uh, you know war uh, other issues but what really matters is whether the corporate uh, you know will keep growing at uh, a decent uh, rate. Uh, the other thing which I wanted to sort of highlight is, um, you know, again, this is uh, sort of capturing the, uh, you know, long term uh, positive trends about uh, the markets as such. So if you if one focuses on the top chart, uh, this is the Nifty returns uh, uh, on a yearly basis. So if you look at the yearly uh, returns, uh, we have seen through time that there are uh, periods of upside and then there are periods uh, year or so where the markets also uh, gives negative return. But again, one uh, you know when one actually looks at the five rolling returns, there are hardly any periods where the markets have actually given negative returns, which means uh, that again, very important to have a sort of long term view as far as equities are concerned. Uh, I think long term the markets tend to uh, meet broadly the investors' expectation of uh, beating inflation, and that is what uh, one should focus on. Uh, one more point which I wanted to sort of highlight here is the fact that uh, if one looks at the last seven years uh, in a row, uh, Nifty returns has been positive. And uh, I think uh, never in the past we have had, uh, you know, uh, continuous uh, markets actually delivering positive returns. So this is something which uh, needs to be highlighted at this point in time, uh, uh, which basically is uh, sort of a, uh, you know, concern in, uh, in, uh, in some form or fashion. Uh, the uh, so so I think that leads to very important aspect of uh, uh, you know uh, the thought process here is uh, if uh, corporate earnings is what matters then can the corporate uh, you know India achieve 12 to 13 percent earnings CAGR over the next uh, 10 years or so. So I think this is something which is uh, uh, going to be the important driving factor for equities uh, over the next decade. And uh, as far as uh, this particular fact is concerned, it is definitely very unpredictable. We have seen how uh, there are periods where the earnings have not grown. There are periods certainly when the earnings tend to catch up. And hence, one needs to understand that there is volatility, there is cyclicality uh, in businesses, there is cyclicality in earnings. Uh, but uh, given the today's context, uh, there are let's say more reasons to believe that uh, maybe we have a better outlook over the next uh, five, seven years. And uh, some of the important factors which we believe are uh, favorable today is uh, let's say the government's uh, pro-growth stance, which uh, uh, you know is uh, giving us good confidence that uh, there is a strong support from government to boost uh, the growth uh, in the economy. We have seen last two years uh, during COVID, I think uh, most economies, including the developed economies, have uh, seen a lot of pain, whereas we have uh, stood strong uh, despite uh, so much of uh, issues uh, going uh, you know, around the world. 
and that is uh, in a way also uh, uh, you know important factor which shows that uh, the policies in india uh, have uh, been uh, so ex uh, uh, you know uh, has so come out that it has allowed us to remain quite resilient and uh, with the pro growth stance we believe that uh, growth is going to be an important factor as far as india is concerned uh, the um, other uh, important uh, factor to note is uh, as the economy revives uh, there was a low private sector participation in the past we have seen a gradual improvement taking place and as uh, we see uh, growth sort of normalizing or growth recovering uh, we will have more private sector participation and there are more ammunition being put for uh, the private sector to uh, uh, you know come out and spend more uh with us you know small uh, uh, you know thought uh, where you know government is looking mm -hmm. to make india a manufacturing hub uh, uh today manufacturing accounts for let's say 16% of the gdp the idea is to take to this to 25% and also the idea is to increase the level of exports what india does now this itself can add uh, meaningfully uh, to the uh, uh, to the growth uh, of uh, our gdp and this will also a broad base uh, uh, our overall uh, sectors which will benefit uh, because of uh, the initiatives which the government is taking uh, in let's say pli privatization of defense uh our indigenization of uh, you know defense uh, rail spends on railways uh, rural spend uh, spends on you know water related activity so i think all of this is definitely giving us uh, a lot of uh, hope that uh, the growth going forward is going to be more broad based and better as compared to what it was in the past a lot of the reforms we have uh, seen getting implemented over the course of uh, last 5 6 years i think the benefit of that will also be seen uh the reforms which started with uh, demonetization um, uh, 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 banking sector uh, uh, reforms all of those were more uh, you know of cleansing in nature which actually at that period we had uh, the uh, economy actually going through a slow period but after the cleansing i think now most of the reforms which the government has uh, been implementing is uh, more driving the economy forward uh, to uh, you know sound growth Uh, uh as we move forward so i think those benefit of that will be seen uh, uh coming across and very important which uh, i think uh, india uh, uh, is going to get benefited because of uh, the demographic dividend which uh, the country is likely to reap uh, i think it will be the only country with uh, the rising working age population so this should anyways mean that the per capita income of uh, the citizens will grow and that will mean that um, uh, there is more demand for uh, uh, higher and better consumption there is uh, more uh, uh, you know demand for organized uh, uh, sector and i think that is what is the shift which uh, we believe uh, should aid in the uh, you know overall uh, market share gains of uh, the companies which uh, are well organized and are uh, you know uh, uh, led by good competent management uh, so i think these are some of the important factors which makes us believe that uh, you know the corporate india has the potential to grow uh, upwards of 12 to 13% over the next decade or so uh, there are some uh, uh, risks as well in terms of uh, what are the factors which can uh, work against uh, these uh, uh, these positive factors i think one important one is the interest rate we last two years as the interest rate started going up it actually had uh, impact on the uh, uh, returns from the asset classes it has uh created a, a good amount of negative impact on major economies uh, global developed economies which are talking about recession so i think this is something which uh, one has to keep in mind um, uh, if the interest rate keeps rising or remains high that can cause a temporary period of uh, uh, you know sluggish uh, growth uh, then the other uh, aspect is what are policies the government have has announced Uh, we need to keep focusing on the speed of execution till now i think we are uh, uh, quite satisfied with the way uh, execution is happening across uh, various uh, uh, areas but i think uh, this needs to sustain and continue and i think important is that as we focus more and more on manufacturing we would need more skilled 
uh, labor, I think, which is um, uh, going to be a key uh, thing to focus on. So these are uh, maybe some of the long term uh, uh, areas to focus on. But uh, are there? How should one think of uh, the short term? Uh, definitely, I think short term we are uh, seeing some challenges, but I think these are always going to be there. Uh, we we would never uh, have periods with uh, good amount of certainty and good amount of clarity of how growth is going to come by. There are going to be hindrances and uh, issues. Uh, so in terms of the short term challenges, uh, I think we are currently dealing uh, with a very uncertain macro environment, uh, which is keeping uh, the uh, you know pressure uh, on the investors in terms of uh, how much risk one is willing to undertake. Uh, the valuations, uh, Kalpen showed uh, the range of equity valuations. Uh, so definitely we are, uh, as far as equity valuations are concerned, we are uh, slightly higher than the uh, long-term averages and hence uh, given uh, some of these challenges, higher interest rate, the uncertain macro environment, it is possible that ma uh, markets uh, could consolidate a bit, but that also gives an opportunity for long-term investors uh, to uh, uh, you know, benefit out of uh, the uh, uh, markets generally you know, becoming uh, reasonable in terms of valuations as it consolidates uh, going forward. Uh, the um, the uh, the other uh, aspect is, uh, you know, there is uh, some slowdown in consumption at the bottom of the pyramid. And I think that is something uh, to be uh, sort of worried about. So that's broadly the thoughts uh, as far as the uh, long term outlook and the short term challenges are concerned. Uh, let me uh, focus on um, the uh, fund performance and, uh, uh, you know, Kalpen touched upon uh, some of our flagship funds which have been sort of um, uh, underperforming and uh, we are uh, very cognizant of that. Uh, so, you know, I would like to talk about uh, first uh, the DSP Midcap Fund, which is uh, the largest fund where uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, we have investors who have remained invested for long and we are thankful uh, to those investors. Uh, and, uh, you know, this fund, uh, again, it has uh, underperformed and we believe that this underperformance is uh, not uh, new in terms of uh, uh, we have seen, I, I think the performance of the fund itself is uh, cyclical in nature. So if you go back in history, uh, here's the chart which actually captures the uh, three-year rolling alpha of uh, the fund uh, going back since 2009. Uh, so we had this period where, uh, you know, the fund um, uh, really underperformed the index and uh, these are the phases where uh, our philosophy, what we follow doesn't match uh, with the market philosophy and uh, which is where, uh, you know, we tend to underperform. Uh, but more importantly, I, I, you know, what we have observed is that as we keep, uh, uh, you know, in a very disciplined manner, uh, sticking to our philosophy of uh, long-term investment, uh, our approach of, uh, you know, uh, buying companies uh, with a more business orientation, buying them for long-term uh, buy and hold approach. I think those philosophies have uh, uh, worked in the long term. There are periods of underperformance. We understand, we try to analyze what are the reasons, uh, you know, which has uh, gone and hurt the performance. And then, uh, you know, as the market cycles change, as, um, uh, you know, some of our uh, um, uh, uh, you know, overall thesis starts working. I think the performance tends to come back. So, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, current uh, stage, I think we are at a worst point, and uh, uh, we, uh, I'll just speak about what actions we are taking. What have we done? Uh, and we believe uh, we are very confident that with the kind of uh, companies we own and uh, the kind of businesses we own, uh, we should see uh, recovery in performance as well. Uh, the important factor here is, uh, you know, I spoke about uh, the uh, philosophy of the fund uh, and uh, or the philosophy which we follow as far as uh, uh, these uh, funds are concerned. I think uh, I showed to you how the growth uh, remains an important aspect uh, for uh, the performance of equities and what we have focused on. This is uh, this chart actually gives the data uh, of the DSP Midcap Fund uh, as an aggregate. And if we look at uh, the important metrics here, uh, uh, the last uh, five years data suggests that the fund uh, has companies which has grown upwards of 20% in terms of their profitability. 
the other factors are more qualitative factors in terms of ROEs, in terms of the debt level. I mean, these are some of the hygiene factors which we try and uh, look for in our companies, which gives us confidence about their uh, long term nature. But more importantly, if we keep focusing on businesses and companies which uh, have the potential to grow at uh, as, uh, 20 percent plus, I think uh, the overall uh, it, it may have periods of underperformance, but it will also uh, lead to sound performance in the long term. Now, uh, you know, also what has uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the last two years has been uh, the period which has actually impacted uh, the performance for the long term also. So as far as this fund is concerned, and we have sort of enumerated what are the reasons uh, which, uh, you know, has led to this underperformance. Uh, there are some misses uh, which uh, uh, has happened as far as, uh, uh, you know, our ownership is concerned. So we clearly missed the mid cap IT rally, uh, which took place. Uh, we sort of stayed away from inferior businesses. We focused on uh, high quality businesses and we had this last two years of, uh, uh, you know, low quality uh, uh, moves actually uh, affected us uh, majorly. The other aspect is that we, uh, as I said, we are more buy and hold in our approach and we saw very uh, sharp uh, sectoral shifts which took place in the market. Uh, you know, we had uh, sectors rallying for five, seven months and then it moved to other sectors and our ability to change that fast was uh, less uh, given our approach uh, to look at the businesses. And I think that is something which uh, uh, hurt us. The other factor is that we are also invested in companies which we believe uh, have good long term outlook, but are currently consolidating or experiencing slow growth, uh, for example, pharmaceutical or specialty chemicals. Uh, and uh, uh, they are also uh, not only facing slow growth, but are also impacted on the profitability front, uh, which we believe is temporary in nature. Uh, but those are uh, some of the um, uh, reasons which uh, has uh, sort of worked against us and maybe what has uh, uh, worked uh, in our favor or, or what are we doing to uh, look at improvising performance. So one uh, expected valuations and we have uh, taken a call to uh, trim uh, IT when it had reached the top valuations. Uh, we sort of avoided a lot of these new age low profit businesses. Uh, we also uh, uh, have exited uh, expensive durable names, which are seeing uh, slow down uh, right now. Uh, and uh, at times uh, there were periods where we had to take hard decision companies, uh, which we really liked and had uh, kept performing for, uh, you know, century, uh, uh, you know, like City Union Bank. Uh, we had taken a uh, you know, hard decision to trim position here because we didn't see uh, within a reasonable time period, them recovering back in terms of uh, the business. So I think from uh, the overall uh, our experience uh, is has been that we have stayed disciplined in terms of uh, our uh, process and approach in terms of stock selection. But uh, these are the uh, things which uh, actually hurt us. And one important learning for us has been uh, that, uh, um, you, you know, our sizing decisions uh, uh, could have been better, uh, you know, when looked at uh, some of these uh, uh, segments. I mean, we could have had uh, slightly uh, uh, better sizing uh, decisions for some of the sectors and that could have worked well, which is anyways part of uh, now, uh, you know, our own internal assessment and we would uh, like to take that as an advantage. Uh, this is a very small uh, example uh, here just to sort of showcase uh what uh, you know how the fund is actually uh, faring right now and uh, you know it is uh, why the fund is suffering so this example is from one of the investi companies we own uh, which is uh, ipka labs and uh, you know we uh, had owned this company for long enough uh, uh, 2014 was a period and this is uh, you, you know maybe uh, uh, you know to us it is one of the uh, good performing companies with highest ROCEs uh, in the past and uh, great management. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, they went through their own crisis since 2014. Uh, uh, you know, they had the USFD problem. And if we look at this period uh, you know, during which we uh, actually doubled down our position, this was a period when the stock didn't do any well and uh, any uh, stock didn't do, uh, in stock, stock didn't go anywhere. And it hurt our performance just like today it is hurting uh, the uh, the overall uh, 
uh, fund is actually uh, in similar situation where some of the businesses are consolidating or are under temporary problems and as soon as these problems were resolved we saw a massive uh, uh, you know uh, price improvement taking place uh, in this uh, company so i think there is uh, at times there are periods when when the waiting period is long in but one has to remain patient uh, uh, the challenge is also to for us uh, because we are in a daily nav uh, uh, you know type of an environment we have to be conscious of that as well uh, but uh, you know we have to strike a balance between high quality good businesses and allowing it to uh, play through over a period of time the uh, the stock is again going through consolidation phase is what we feel in terms of the business they are doing quite well uh, you know as i said they were having a good roc then the problem occurred they came back right now again maybe they are consolidating and we'll see uh, them coming back so i think uh, that's what um, uh, explains um, uh, uh, you know so, some of the underperformances which the fund has seen uh, maybe in the interest of time uh, let me just focus on um, uh, the flexi cap and the equity bond fund which again has seen underperformance and uh, broadly similar reasons uh, the portfolio manager atul bhole who uh, uh, some of you might have interacted with again the focus for him uh, is uh, more quality and growth uh, and uh, the last one and a half year or two year has been uh, you know more favoring uh, businesses which were let's say value oriented or psu banks where he uh, has taken a view uh, of not uh, investing because uh you know of his conscious decision to remain with high quality companies and businesses and uh, again his stance has been that uh, during a period where uh, these companies are going through uh, underperformance like right now uh, these are also the businesses which uh, you know becomes stronger and in every crisis they tend to gain uh, market share and once uh, the uh, mean reversion takes place once uh, the issues which uh, are hurting uh, these companies Uh, they uh, they they sort of moderate uh, so for example the commodity prices and all which have gone up which are which are hurting uh, some of the high quality consumer companies as they start moderating i think uh, these companies uh, will again emerge stronger and will come back so uh, but more importantly uh, the uh, the important element here is that uh, whether the fund manager is sticking to the philosophy what he is following or a gives, gives in to the Uh, uh uh environment and uh, you know starts uh, defocusing on uh, the philosophy i think it is important to uh keep focusing on the philosophy and once the cycle changes that will uh, lead to a better performance so i think that's uh, in a nutshell uh, what i wanted to sort of um, uh, say here but uh, let me end by thanking all of you uh, for uh, you know patiently remaining invested in our schemes uh, we are uh, you know cognizant of underperformance in some of the schemes and uh, we are working very hard uh, to make sure that uh, we come back and uh, we give you all a better experience from where we are today uh, so thank you and now i will hand it over to uh, sandeep uh, from uh, our fixed income desk uh, over to you sandeep thank you so much vinay thank you so much uh, good evening everyone thank you very much for being here i will just share my presentation as a speed uh, so we are in a very interesting time in fixed income right now as you can uh, probably see it's not just in india but globally we have seen a stark uh, increase in uh, rates across the globe be in india we have us or we have europe how do we see the rates from here as kalpin uh, rightly pointed out we have seen a range of 5% to 9% in india in the past couple of decades so 7.5% we are certainly somewhere around the average but if we take a closer look at the chart about how the where the yields are well today 7.5% is certainly on a higher side if we look in the, in the past 20 years but what this chart does not show is that india has changed a lot in last 20 years in 20 years india has become much more structured there have been a lot of structural changes there have been a lot of supply um, chain changes and probably this chart shows it better so there were times around a decade back when the yields were uh, touching 8% or a little higher today we are at 7.5% but during that time india's inflation used to be more than 10% india's inflation used to be in double digits It's been nearly a decade since India's inflation has been around that level. 
In fact, I remember about a decade back when inflation used to hit 6%. The headlines on the newspapers used to be that inflation has sharply come down to 6%. Today, when we look at the headline inflations, they would say that inflation is high at 6%. What it means is that inflation has structurally come down in India. Anything around 6% is something probably which uh, even Reserve Bank of India, Government of India are not comfortable with. What it means from the debt uh, perspective is that rates, which are at 7.5%, which probably may seem like they are the average of 20 years, but with inflation expected not to be higher than 6%, this 7.5% of 10 year yield is a very high yield. How does it matter for the end investor? Well, as most of you would be knowing that when the yields are high, what you do is you invest in debt funds. Because when the yields fall, not only have you locked in at a higher rate uh, with your investments, but you also make capital gains. So from that perspective, I really think that this is a pink of a time the, for the debt funds. We have seen the worst of the year in the last two years, we have seen yields rise up uh, significantly high, nearly about uh, 150 to 200 basis point, 1.5 1. to 2%. And with inflation being limited by both RBI and government of India, we will most probably see yields either consolidate over here or come down. And thus, this is probably one of the better times in India for us to invest in debt funds. Is inflation the only thing that matters? Not really. So we have got, like Vineet mentioned there, uh, IQDT has got a framework on which to base their decision making. Similarly, for fixed income, we've got a 360 degree framework where we look at what RBI is doing. So, inflation is probably a part of that. We also look at government of India, whether the government of India is giving too many subsidies, whether they're checking the price rise. Similarly, we look at what is happening in the US and the other countries because that eventually India is again, you know, unlike last 20 years back when India was probably a little isolated, today India is very much interlinked with the rest of the world. And of course, look at the regulations which may not come up as a headline news again but these are some you know, things which really lose the yield. I would not go too much in depth about it probably we've got GSP Converse uh, on our website which typically is a monthly uh, publication which talks about all these details what we see how we see the fixed income market in India. Nonetheless I just want to show um, to all our investors that when we make decisions to buy, uh, buy or sell uh, in the debt market, those decisions are based on favor, those based decisions are based on strong analysis. Uh, Kalpain mentioned that when we rose, we had cut down the duration in most of our active funds. Well, that was based on favor. Today, as we sit, we are adding duration or adding risk in our debt funds. Why? Because that is based on favor. But what is the philosophy that we run our fixed income desk with? Well, the main aim is that we have to get performance, we have to make money, but not at the cost of losing money. So you have to protect your money. That is uh, very primary for us. Because if you want to take higher risk, then probably equity funds, our equity funds are a better segment. The main aim for debt funds is to protect your money and still give you good returns. And that is the philosophy we run. We don't want you to wake up one fine day and find out that is a big um, a big change in the map, and that is really, uh, that is literally what we're working on day in day out. I think one example I'd like to give is supposing there's a bank which is going into moratorium and they increase the returns by 100 base point in the in their fixed deposit. Will you invest in that bank? Uh, will you get FPs in that bank? Most probably you will not. And that is our whole sense that we run our, uh, our debt funds there, that they are quite akin to similar risk. We don't want to invest your money in cases where you might end up losing your money, just like you would not want to lose your FP money in a bank which is in Morocco. We have got two different kind of funds that we run. One is, of course, an active funds where a fund manager increases or decreases the risk based on the framework that I just mentioned. Uh, again, I reiterate, when Kalkin said that we reduce the risk when we were going higher, that means the prices were falling. So those will be our active funds. They limit big fluctuations in their in the NAV and yet deliver uh, performance. On the other hand, we have got passive funds. These passive funds give you a better visibility of returns. You have a little bit better idea that if you are invested passive fund for considerable amount of time, 
or till the maturity, then you will get some kind of visibility of the returns. Uh, we ensure that the uh, bonds that we invest in are quite safe, even in a passive funds, not just in active funds. I think finally, uh, I would like to probably mean whatever I just mentioned in the last four or five minutes about uh, which funds do we think are uh, in the current scenario are probably the best funds to invest in. Well, eventually it just boils down to your horizon. What is the time horizon? If the time horizon is about a year, then in a passive funds, we like DSP savings funds with expected by TMS and point eight zero percent. Similarly, uh, not current by TM, I'll just correct this. The expected by TM uh, in some time will be 7.80%. Similarly, in our active funds, we think ultra short fund is a very good fund. But most of you might be more interested in a little bit longer investments. So if you're looking for three to five year segment, we've got passive fund. As I mentioned, passive funds have got no visibility. So we've got passive funds which are expiring four years or five years, and they've got white in close to seven and a half percent. On our active funds uh, uh, perspective, you've got short-term fund. It's got a yield, uh, current yield of 7.65%. If you go a little bit longer uh, duration, and if you are an investor who's um, willing to take a little bit of underperformance for a, for a few weeks, for months, but you want a higher return in the long, complete interest rate cycle, then we strongly suggest that the 10 year maturity DSP fund is probably the right point uh, of the curve. Uh, it's YTM is 10.65%. Uh, and on our dynamic uh, active fund category, we suggest that uh, DSP strategic bond fund, which, will, which rides up and down of the interest rate cycle and tries to capture the major moves uh, correctly. I guess that is it from my side. Thank you so much. I'll hand it over to Ankita. Thank you, uh, Kalpain, Vineet, Sandeep, for running us through your thoughts. Uh, for our investors who are listening to us, we also have Sahil Kapoor, who's our, who is our head of products, and Anil Ghilani, who's head of casualty and products. So feel free to ask questions. We have experts across uh, domains sitting with us today, and I will start with the questions that we've gotten. Uh, Kalpain, starting with you first, um, Tarun has asked a question. You've been in a sales background. How can mm -hmm. distributors increase their AUM? What kind of pitches are useful? How can uh, DSP help them? And a similar question asked by Preeti is that how would you deal with investors who are financially capable of scaling their investments, but they are jittery about the volatility? So any tips from you for uh, distributors there? Am I audible now? Yes. Hi. Yeah. So Tarun, uh, I think uh, see in my 25 years of experience, I have learned from various investors. Mm -hmm. And um, one principle I always keep in mind is that the experience of my investors over time should meet the expectation. And hence, setting the expectations right and uh, guiding them right in terms of what to expect and uh, the do's and don'ts of investing. You know, the reason I say this is that uh, investing is a minority's game. You know, majority does not win here. Uh, there are very few who eventually are able to earn significantly superior return over um, uh, fixed deposits or, you know, even 8 to 10 percent return. And uh, the reason for this is uh, the behavior gap that I spoke about. So I, I think. Uh, uh, my learnings have been that if you are able to help investors or educate investors about the, the nature of the beast or the nature of uh, the asset class, whether it is fixed income or equity, and then give them the picture up front and then guide them that when you go overweight, underweight, or how do you put your portfolio together, what should be your time horizon, what risk you should not take uh, is uh, you know one important input that I have learned. So the first thing is spend more time in uh, educating investors and you know helping them um, start investing. And the second rule is uh, I've seen that many times when investors invest and suddenly they see their NAVs uh, come down or uh, markets uh, you know create volatility, uh, there is a temporary loss of trust, uh, which is because of the fluctuation. And whenever there are these moments of loss of trust, investors go away. So uh, it's very important that. Um, the experience and the journey of their NAVs uh, is, uh, you know, 
uh, aligned to what their expectations are. So clarifying expectations is very important. Underplaying is very important. Um, uh, not overestimating returns is very important. Not extrapolating the last one year, two year, three year is very important. Not selling what has done extremely well in the last cycle. So those are some of the learnings that I have had. And I think uh, I keep learning every day. Uh, even while I made this presentation, I was feeling, uh, you know, still that a lot of uh, jargons are there even when I spoke. So simplifying is very important, talking a language that uh, the customer understands. And I think to the second question, how can DSP help? I think uh, we are making an attempt to open up uh, our experiences, our success factors, our tools, our uh, insights to all of you, uh, you know. So we have two pillars uh, for, uh, for success in this business. One is the pillar of understanding markets and asset classes. So uh, a lot of investment insights are very important. Uh, we need to be aware about market uh, markets and asset classes and not just be a salesperson. We have to be an investment salesperson in this business. So we are, you know, sharing a lot of these insights uh, with whoever wants to learn, whether it is our distributors or even our investors. And I think the second pillar is how to sell in a more effective way. So we have a factory called uh, Power Tools where we have 20, 25 uh, power tools that we've designed, which help the consumer in a very interesting and simple way, learn the concepts of, uh, you know, tax efficiency, uh, how inflation affects uh, portfolios, uh, why it is important to beat inflation, and, you know, many, many uh, nuances like that. I think uh, you should engage with our teams and uh, we'll be very happy to help you in this journey. Thanks. Thanks, Excel Brain. Uh, I will switch gears to Sahil now. Uh, Sahil, there is a pointed question to you from Rakesh saying that if DSP has been writing early warnings and signals and more Netra navigated, etc. Uh, why can't you act on these signs and why does it not reflect in performance? Could you please elaborate this concern? Sure. Thank you, Ankita. That, that's an important question. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of a short story from... Amitabh Ghosh's uh, novel. He's written a book called Nutmeg's Curse. Uh, it's a parable on uh, climate. And in this book, he mentions a very beautiful story where an eminent uh, professor of botany goes to a local village because he wants to uh, go to a rainforest and he picks up a local boy from that village and uh, they both go together. And this young boy, the uh, village boy, He's able to identify each of the various plant species and he's able to give the names of all these plant species to the botanist. And the professor is stunned and he compliments him on his knowledge. But this little boy is dejected. He says that uh, uh, I have learned the names of all the bushes, but I'm yet to learn their song. So I think it's uh, what this boy is saying is metaphorically, it appears that he's talking about the song, but what he's actually saying is the interconnectedness of all these things. So why do we look at all these signals, all these reports, all these data points is we are looking at it from a perspective to cover all bases, understand what is going on in the broader universe, how much of it is applicable and how much of, how much of it is noise and separate them together. And we've been trying to apply all these principles internally. So if you look at, for example, if I were to give you an example, last year at the beginning of 2022, internally, we discussed a number of ideas, for example, banking and financial services sector, which should be overweight. And you will see that reflect across our funds, looking at uh, healthcare as a sector, which appeared uh, to offer great margin of safety. That became a big active weight in a number of our funds. So we've been applying these principles. The only thing is that this song, this interconnectedness will take some time to play out. Uh, it's not a short term quick fix. It's a long term uh, marathon. And I think it will reflect uh, over a period of time. Sure. Thanks, Sahil. Uh and then there's a question for you. Uh, it says that you've been, uh, you know, big promoter of ETFs and index funds. Uh, but Mayank has specifically asked that, you know, uh, what, what, what are the risks to investing in index and ETFs given an incident like Adani could happen any day? Your thoughts? Well, thanks, Mayank, for this very interesting question. Uh, I'd like to take it in two parts. Point number one. Uh, certain names, certain risks can be systemic in nature. Certain certain uh, risks like certain companies uh, could be isolated case. I would like to highlight a little bit uh, history. Let's say if we look at uh, 
Nifty 50 as an index. It has a nature in which companies come in and go out in line with how the market reactions are happening and in line with the uh, price movement and overall market capitalization. So I'll take another example. Uh, apart from what today we are seeing, let's say there is a case in point where companies like DLF was part of the Nifty 50. Uh, it saw uh, inclusion, it saw its own uh, exclusion as a matter of prudent way in which the benchmark automatically weeds out stocks at certain points of time. Uh, now, sitting today and looking at hindsight, one does not even feel anything that, oh, that company was there in the uh, Nifty 50 index and then what happened to that? Let's say more recent history, if, if we look at it, it was an example of, let's say, for example, Yes Bank. It was there as a part of the Nifty 50 at some point of time, it started correcting at some point the weightage was very low and it exited from the nifty 50 index so in index investing structurally what you're getting is the overall participation in the market and thereby even if there is some stock which goes wrong even if there is a correction in that stock automatically at certain points of time the portfolio will weed it out and remove it and some other company will come in and take over from there but if you look at now hindsight and if you see how the overall performance of let's say Nifty 50 or Nifty Next 50 or any index, if you look at it, it has factored in these kind of in and outflows and corrections of certain stocks. But even otherwise, it still appears reasonably attractive in terms of an investable uh, avenue. So with that, I feel that yes, most certainly uh, one should definitely consider index investing as a part of a core allocation to your portfolio and for additional satellite allocation, wherever you want to take some tactical calls, etc., or some kind of a uh, 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 allocation in your portfolio, you look at active funds as well. Sure, Anil. Thanks for that. Vineet, I'll quickly move to the questions to you. Uh, Dhirain, Akbar, uh, they had asked questions on mid-cap underperformance, but I think you very well comprehensively covered it in your presentation itself. So I'll move to uh, Nikhil's question that how do you decide percent allocation for any sector and which are your top picks uh, in the next five years, sectoral top picks in the next five years? So, uh, you know, as far as the um, uh, mid cap and small cap funds are concerned, uh, and it is more a bottom up uh, stock picking, uh, which we uh, actually do uh, for the funds. And uh, sectoral uh, uh, exposure is basically an outcome of how we look at companies. But at the same time, we are aware about uh, you know not letting the sector exposure go overboard. And uh, I think uh, the maximum uh, I remember we've gone must have been uh, 25, 27 percent in any sector. So I think uh, that is uh, broadly uh, you know how we sort of uh, think about the sectors at the moment. Um, you know there are. Uh, so you know, I was talking about uh, overall uh, broad basing of the growth matrix, and I believe that uh, many segments uh, of the economy actually are likely to participate uh, with whatever is happening. Um, you know, from the uh, government's uh, uh, reforms initiative, I would imagine that broader manufacturing as a theme uh, could become large theme. Uh, you know, if one thinks that even from 16% to of GDP, uh, even if it goes to 20%, not 25, that itself can be a, um, uh, you know, big opportunity as far as the overall theme is concerned. Now, within that, uh, one can look at selecting uh, various sub segments, but that is one broad theme which we like. Uh, the other uh, theme which uh, we are uh, uh, for, uh, right now, given the um, evaluations and also uh, the sector's overall underperformance over the last two, three years, uh, pharmaceutical companies are really looking uh, good investments. They have already seen the pain uh, in terms of their uh, margins uh, getting affected or growth, uh, international growth getting challenged. I think those uh, maybe uh, are behind uh, in due course. They may see those reversals taking place and the valuations are pretty uh, reasonable and conservative at the moment. So I think that's one sector which uh, we are uh, quite uh, positive about uh, over the longer term. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think within the consumers, I think consumers overall is seeing slowdown right now. So, and uh, 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 stocks are uh, expensive uh, within that category, but uh, there is um, within consumer discretionary where we are sort of positive on is the automobile because automobile again, uh, from the business cycle perspective, it has seen uh, 
uh, low cycle over the last three years and uh, which means that uh, uh, you know as uh, the uh, uh, recovery takes place we would uh, see a better cycle for the uh, automobile sector as such so within the consumer uh, as a category i think automobile is something which uh, so i think automobile will have both auto auto angst uh, will be part of the same uh, category as such and that's where uh, we are sort of uh, having a positive view so i think broadly uh, uh, and banking anyways uh, you know looks good in its proxy to the economic revival as we will see uh, the uh, revival taking place banking sector the balance sheets have become quite uh, good in terms of their npas and all and i think uh, selectively one can sort of think about uh, looking at uh, uh, banks where uh, they have had good history of controlling credit cost. Thanks, Vineet. Uh, Sandeep, a quick question to you from Ramanujam. SWP versus fixed deposits, for, uh, considering the tax saving angle, which one would you re recommend for uh, retirement planning? Well, I would certainly recommend uh, SWP. Sure. Uh, thanks, Sandeep. Uh, switching gears uh, back to Kalpain. Kalpain, you've met a lot of investors on ground uh, in the past. What do you think, what did you hear about DSP, good or bad? And how did you act on that feedback in the last uh, few months or years at DSP? Kalpain, you are not uh, unmuted. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, last two years have been a bit challenging for us, like I highlighted in the scorecard in terms of some of our funds doing very well and some not doing well. So the feedback uh, from uh, investors on ground is many times mixed. People are happy about, uh, you know, the way we uh, honestly manage money, the way we uh, keep things simple, the way we try to educate, inform and uh, transparently communicate our investment frameworks, our uh, approach to investing. But at the same time, there's also, you know, always uh, rightly so, this uh, demand that uh, you wanted to very quickly reflect in your fund performance and uh, what are the steps that you're taking. But I think some of the steps that we've taken is, uh, uh, like I said, we've strengthened our investment team. We've hired few people who come from, you know, a slightly different uh, temperament in terms of managing money. To give an example, a um, few of our uh, recent hires think more from an absolute uh, return perspective or uh, or from you know not just looking at the benchmark though overall as a funder we always had very high uh, active share but um, we are more and more discerning and uh, committed to ensure that uh, you know ultimately everything that we do and the reason for us to exist is that you make more money uh, there are two ways in which we can do that help you meet the market through our passive funds and help you beat the market through our active funds if we uh, execute well uh, we will deliver better returns than passive funds if we don't execute execute well, it will be the other way around. But I am very confident because you know there is a method to madness. Uh, there is discipline. There is uh, uh, you know a, a clear awareness of what we are doing right, and we want to stick to that. And where we have made mistakes or errors or judgments, and we want to improve on that. So we've hired uh, you know a lot of people in in our uh, investment communication uh, desk because. Uh, we realized a lot of investors said that, and this was a few years back, that uh, many of your funds are doing well and you would love to learn more about uh, investing through rules, investing insights, uh, how to look at markets, help us understand more macro. So we've hired a couple of people, including one of you, which is you, uh, to, to help uh, communicate better. So I think these are a few steps that we have taken. And uh, like I said, um, one thing that gives me Satisfaction is that I always hear that you know this company has been around for 26 years. The group has been around for 160 years. Uh, uh, we we may you know err sometimes in terms of our execution and delivery, but from an intent point of view, we we'll never do uh, anything wrong. We we this is a business of fiduciary responsibility and dealing with people's money, and um, I want to live up to that. And I think we have to step up uh, you know uh, on on some of our large funds because see what happens is that most of our large funds. There have been funds which have also had stellar uh, past performances like mid cap, small cap, or even flexi cap in 2019 and 20. And what tends to happen is uh, when uh, the performance is very uh, high, a lot more new money comes in. And uh, while we've tried to be, you know, more uh, responsible in terms of even guiding that performance can have cycles, uh, we have to ensure that when we get a lot of new money, that money also gets uh, 
uh, experience as it expects. And I think uh, that is something that all of us here in front of you are committed and uh, to make it happen. Sure. Uh, thanks, Karpain, for that. Switching is back to Sahil. Sahil, there is a question from Uday saying that Nasdaq 100 is significantly down in the last 12 to 15 months. Uh, he says that this appears to be a good time to invest in MF on Nasdaq 100, and most of the companies in the index have significant cash and cash flow and are investing heavily in technology and earnings, which we'll get back in two years. So, what should be the allocation to this market in the overall portfolio with five years view? And of course, our offerings on the same. Sure. Thanks, Sude, for the question. I pick up two very important words where you say five years. So I think this is a space which is probably structural if you look at it from a five to ten year perspective. Otherwise, when you look at it from a short term perspective, we have to uh, understand that the valuations are still above average. When you look back in history and see where do these stocks have, where have these stocks traded over a period of time, they are still maybe. Uh, 15 to 20% higher than what they used to do as a group collectively uh, in the past. So the valuations are still not uh, juicy or uh, cheap for you to do lump sum investing. So I think the best thing to do in this space is to do a systematic investment plan. And uh, Kalpain showed a slide initially showing that one of our fund, which invests in innovation and technology, it has shown this clearly that if you follow a systematic investment plan, even a sector which is extremely volatile, uh, it could work out in your favor, right? And this is a very good example of this playing out in this theme. So I guess over the next five to 10 years, there is a structural story to follow. There is a 15% earnings kegger which has happened in the past and maybe at some percentage it could happen in the future. If you believe in that story, if you are, uh, you know, if you see that playing out in numbers, once valuations are cheap, you become a little aggressive, but till then, just continue your systematic investment plan in this, this study. Sure, Sahil. Thanks for that one. Um, Anil, there is a question by Ayushi Gupta saying that I have been invested in Equal Nifty since a longer term as I was uh, an innovative, it was an innovative idea and worked well in US markets. What is your current view on this? Is the outperformance of this strategy over now? Super question, uh, Ayushi. Thanks for raising this. You are absolutely right. Equal weight as a strategy has done extremely well across time periods in uh, the global markets, especially, especially in the US. And from that, we tried to adapt it and we tried to test it out in Indian markets before we launched it. We were the first to launch equal weight on Nifty 50 way back in 2017. So we tried a similar type of approach on multiple indices in India. And we found a most suitable uh, risk and return outcome in the nifty 50 equal weight so we went ahead and launched that uh, as a index fund i believe that there will be certain pockets of period or certain market cycles wherein equal weight will tend to underperform especially when there is a large polarization in the market taking place like what we had seen in 2018 little bit to the starting of 2019 but in times like current situation where there is a sideward moving market or there is a broad based rally in the market in such situations in the past, we have seen that equal weight as a strategy performs extremely well. So I, I, I like to think of it in simple terms, like, you know, as a well-balanced cricket team. Suppose you have a team and you are super focused only on one star batsman and one bowler and assume on that day, your that star batsman is uh, injured and the pitch is such that that pace bowler is not able to perform his magic. Then how much alone one you player as a captain will do. But instead of that, if all your team players are very well balanced, each of them is a superb fielder, you have two, three other all-rounders and good batsmen, then you are back in the game. Similarly, in Nifty 50 equal weight as a strategy, we have equal weighted all of the companies. So, it fulfills two basic principles of investing. First principle, invest in good companies, which are leaders in their sectors and who have seen multiple business cycles. So, Nifty 50 fulfills that. And the second point is that be well diversified across stocks and sectors. So by being equal weight, again, we are not overweight on some sector in a very large way, but we are well balanced. So I feel, uh, thanks uh, 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 Ayushi Madam for raising this question. I feel this strategy can do good for from your long-term asset allocation perspective, definitely. Sure. Thanks, Anil. A uh, direct question to you, Kalpain, asking why don't you launch more NFOs? Your take on it? 
See, we have, uh, I think, a reasonably wide range of funds and uh, we definitely do launch new funds whenever we feel either the time is right or uh, we feel that uh, in the next uh, three to five years, uh, it can help you make more money. And it is a different product than what is available in, in our existing pair of products. Uh, see, at the end of the day, in India, there are not more than 150 stocks to uh, invest. So how many more funds do you need to participate in that? I think we have a reasonably complete range of active funds. Uh, we definitely need to add few more funds on our passive range, which we continue to do. So in the last few quarters, we have launched few passive funds as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I gave example of uh, our oldest fund, the BSP FlexiCap fund, um, uh, it has a 26 year track record. It has uh, delivered reasonably well over long periods of time. Uh, rolling return, it has done well. Last year has been challenging. Uh, we, we explained reasons for that and we are very confident that the core ideology is intact of buying good companies and staying uh, put with them. So uh, we actually did an OFO instead of an NFO. We did an old fund offer, uh, which is only to you know make uh, our investors uh, recognize that um, uh, NFO uh, at 10 rupees uh, is not uh, the only way to think about investing because many investors still feel that if the NAV is 10 rupees versus 80 or 100 or 200 or many other funds, this is cheaper. Uh, not exactly, because um, the portfolio that gets created is of very similar companies. But uh, wherever we felt uh, the need to do it, uh, we have done NFO. So in the last year, we did Global Innovation Fund because we didn't have uh, an India tech fund. And we also didn't have uh, any product which gives access to the innovators and uh, the dominating uh, tech companies of the world. And like Sai mentioned, it is a long-term mega trend. We didn't have a product for that. So we did one fund and we uh, we felt that uh, maybe, you know, uh, there is still a lot more fraud there. So uh, we did it very cautiously, cautiously with an SIP uh, format. Uh, we we felt that uh, in 2020, um, over a 10 year period, um, you know, good companies, but, um, you know, for in, falling in the bucket of uh, value, underperforming almost for 10 years in India or globally. Uh, and where, hence we did an NFO of the value fund, which mixes uh, Indian companies and global companies in a 70-30 ratio. It gives uh, amazing, uh, you know, it gives good tax efficiency and it gives um, a reasonable amount of um, low correlation with global uh, and Indian uh, equity asset class. So with lesser volatility, one can aim to get uh, overall returns of equity as an asset class from companies of India and companies outside the world. So we brought that product also to the market. We did few NFOs for passive funds in fixed income. So we will definitely, so we, we don't have a binary view that, you know, NFOs are good or bad. Uh, if they make sense, if we feel that we should invest our money at a point in time in that product, uh, we will launch that fund. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we keep uh, highlighting our views and opinions about it. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for being so quality over quantity is what you are focusing on right now. Uh, if I may quickly take a few questions that uh, I could write through. There was a question from Madhav saying, is DSP concentrating on green energy and EVs? Yes, we are. Our World Energy Fund is purely a clean energy fund now. And we are looking uh, to have a fund which is into future of transport, which would capture the theme on EVs. Uh, there's a question, uh, Sahir, I'll pass this to you. Uh, how is your value fund different and uh, why is it not uh, performing well in recent months? So the construct of the value fund is very interesting. What it does is that uh, it looks at diversifying across various segments. First and foremost is it does not invest where large part of funds invest, which is the banking and financial services sector, largely lenders. So it does. So when you look at any large cap equity fund, uh, you will see that between 30 to 35 percent of the overall fund will be invested with lenders and other financial institutions. This fund takes away that slice and goes and invests in international money managers, in, in international investment managers of very high repute, which follow very sound principles of investing. So, for example, when you look at the breakup of value fund, the largest weight in the fund, which is Berkshire Hathaway at 7 percent, gives you a flavor of the kind of investing it does overseas. And second and more important thing that it is a rule-based fund. The India part that you speak about, that I spoke about, uh, it is based on certain rules. Uh, what it does is it removes all the companies which are low on quality or probably uh, with some parameters removes bad companies. You get a list of companies which score highly on quality. 
from those companies you apply various filters and get to understand which are the companies which have good margin of safety and that is how the fund is made uh, once those companies are selected there is a, a full analyst team which gives their recommendation in terms of what companies not to choose so from top to bottom there is a method of eliminating bad companies and you end up with a portfolio which is pristine uh, and plus you also get a 30% global exposure uh, from managers which are very high quality for example one of the managers mandate is to outperform oecd inflation by 6% over all cycles so these are the kind of money managers which are there in the value fund so if an investor starts his journey uh, of investing and if he wants a portfolio which is both domestic and international i think this is a very very good mix over the last 3 years uh, the overall strategy has outperformed its benchmark outperformed the indian piece has outperformed or nearly performed as well as uh, nifty with lesser volatility and the international piece has also outperformed the international benchmark and when you mix them together it has outperformed the nse 500 or probably given very similar returns so this is the construct of the fund a uh, lot more people look at this fund from a categorization point of view but the structure of the fund is very very different and that's why i think this is a fund which could be your long term companion in investing sure sir thanks for bringing those nuances out sandeep a quick question to you from viral saying is it advisable to make debt investments now for 3 to 4 years view please suggest the fund you have the highest conviction in absolutely ankita and i think this is one of the best times as i said in my presentation because uh, we are at a higher end of the yield curve a lot of this has already been priced in right now i'm not saying that yields may not move up quite in this point of course but we are not trying to find the peak so when we are looking at 3 to 4 uh, years there are a lot of positives uh, even that can happen and you know we are talking about a longish perspective india could see a significant amount of fpi inflow uh, coming especially if indian bonds are included in the Uh, bond inclusion, uh, which is the passives, uh, passive means. On the other hand, uh, we all know that inflation is quite high right now, and probably if you look at all the central banks across the world, including India, you will see that the projections of inflation one year, two years down the line are much lower than where it is right now, and probably within the comfort zone, because that is quite important. While inflation may come lower, but is it still about the comfort zone? Well, most of the central banks don't think so. so i think if you got a horizon of 3 years plus or even 3 years then it is the right time uh, before i suggest the um, fund probably what i'll say is that why would you want to invest uh, when rates are high well there are two reasons one is of course the fact is you want to lock in high rates the second thing is capital gains now the advantage of the first one is and as i mentioned you know i mentioned a few passive products the advantage of the first uh, kind of strategy is you can invest in a passive product you can lock in higher rates and probably if the rate yields come lower you may not benefit quite a lot from the capital gains because it's pretty much like a uh, certain return i don't use the word certain but visibility of returns but there are other kind of funds in which you know if yields come lower not only have you locked in at a higher rate but when yields come lower you make significant amount of capital gains in my opinion there's a time there one can afford to take a little bit higher risk with the expectation of capital gains so going by this logic i would say that uh, the couple of funds which i really like and it depends on the investor's appetite the invest can take a little bit of uh, nav volatility and if they are uh, a little bit risk averse to immediate uh, volatility then strongly suggest that they should look at uh, our 2033 target maturity fund which i had mentioned which is got gsec and ltl in it very liquid fund very quality states uh, that we have we only take the best states that we have over there probably one of a very unique um, uh, index in the country right now on the other hand what i would also say is that uh, and and the benefit of this is even if you come down three years down the line you are invested in a seven year bond what it means for uninitiated is that you make lot of capital gains also from that it means come over the second is another unique product of ours which is uh, dsp bond fund and as you know kalpin mentioned that we don't want to do nfo so we are uh, it is not a nfo we like to think that it's a oefo so in gsp bond fund what we mean is we are going to keep by four year bond and keep it at four years uh, not going into too much of technicality the advantage it gives is not only the lock in at a higher rate site right now but three years down the line when rates are lower you still invested in a four year bond 
what it means is capital gains. So long story short, probably these two funds will give you very good capital gains if the investor wants to probably go through a little bit more aggressive strategy. Thank you, uh, Sandeep, for a specific answer there. Uh, Kalpen Ankur Mittal says that he loves your presentation and he invests in market every weekend so as to cut down on the no uh, noise. He tries to maintain asset allocation, but what he's not able to handle is that sometimes his active fund starts to underperform the benchmark. He says that uh, how do you manage emotions then? And how long would you be okay with fund manager's conviction with before you switch out? Uh, so I, I wish I had such discipline uh, 20 years back of uh, not looking at noise and reacting. So I think it's a very good... Uh, mental hack to to remain very disciplined in investing and uh, coming to the question you know uh, let's say i in my own portfolio have uh, the largest way to our flexi cap fund which is currently underperforming and i'll give you an actual uh, data point uh, in uh, uh, around 18 or two months back uh, 18 months or two years back the flexi cap fund had uh, nine percent extra performance over its benchmark uh, for that last one year and uh, it looked uh, like, you know, very large outperformance. And you get tempted to put a lot more money there. And these are times to, you know, always say that this too shall pass. Um, uh, alpha also is mean reverting. That extra return keeps mean reverting. And today when we look back, um, the FlexiCap fund has um, a gap of around 4 or 5% versus its benchmark in the last um, one year. Or maybe 3% now that gap has narrowed down. So it's underperforming the benchmark. So there is always that uh, doubt that should I now go back to passive or should I stick to active? Should I remove my money from active and move to passive? Now, uh, if I was my earlier uh, original version, uh, you know, 15 years back, uh, my temptation would be to chase uh, what has done very well in the last one year. But I think in 2008-9, uh, I, I got my first, uh, you know, very important insightful learning that everything keeps change, mean reverting. So, you know, good times turn into bad times, bad times turn into good times. Uh, high returns become low returns in the future, low returns again become high returns mm -hmm. in the future. So these things keep mean reverting. So how in, in portfolio construction, and if I'm comfortable with that, then I'm happy to invest more with him when he underperforms because his underperformance will also mean revert. So let's say one year back when I actually wanted to buy my home and you know take some money out, uh, amongst many funds, I redeemed from the fund which was actually doing better, which is the FlexiCap fund. Um, and last week, I have actually invested in our dynamic asset allocation fund, uh, which is a um, uh, which is uh, a replica of FlexiCap with the uh, asset allocation. So I would uh, say that you know learn about the fund manager. You are already you know uh, a very disciplined investor. The way you approach investing, spend some more time in um, reading through the approach of these managers. Uh, whether it is uh, Atul Bole who focuses on uh, you know high quality businesses as a style. Or if it is Vinith who focuses on, uh, you know, the same uh, ideology in the mid cap and small cap universe, or whether it is um, uh, Abhishek Singh and uh, Rohit who focus first more on valuations before they, uh, you know, start looking at businesses. So every style has its, uh, you know, glory uh, under the sun and different points in time. But in the long term, I think there are two things which matter, good companies and good prices. And uh, I prefer to invest whenever a style underperforms. So uh, that is how I uh, approach uh, my, uh, you know, investing style. Thank I hope you. I answered Ankur's question. I, I think so that uh, that was exactly what Ankur was looking at. And uh, in interest of time, I'm just going to club a few questions. Uh, there's a question from Hardik saying that why DSP uh, doesn't have ETF for new themes like fintech, IT, uh, bank, ETF, gold, etc. Hardik, we are working on all of these ETFs. So we have Bank ETF uh, index, which is Nifty Bank ETF is live now. Uh, we have approval for other ETFs and some of them we have already filed with uh, SEBI. So most likely you will see uh, DSP expanding its offering in the passive range in the coming year. Uh, I think that is all the questions that we have for today. There is one generic question we have from uh, quite a few of investors, which is uh, from Jay Chandran. Uh, Makaran, how to do asset allocation between equity, debt, gold, and silver? And instead of asking this to a particular person, I will take turns 
asking this uh, question that what is your asset allocation strategy in 2023? So Sahil, can we start with you? Sure. Right now, I'll tell you what my current asset allocation is. Right now, I'm I'm about seventy-five uh, percent invested in equity, and uh, about twenty percent invested in debt, and I have five percent exposure to gold mining equities. Very very simplistic, and I have in totality of just five funds. So this is what I have today. Kalpin, um, your asset allocation in twenty twenty three. How is it looking? I have sixty-five percent in equities, which is split fifty in. Uh, Indian equity funds and 15 in global equity funds. I have 25 in um, DSP short-term fund, which is debt. Um, and I have 10 rupees in gold bonds and gold mining fund. Awesome. Anil, you would want to take that? Yes, I think uh, I'll, super point. Uh, from my side, I have approximately 60% uh, in equities, about 37% uh, I had got last, I remember the number exactly. And which was in fixed income debt uh, that includes arbitrage fund. Uh, and I have got about 3% in gold as an asset class, but not in physical gold or uh, bullion. I have it in gold mining equities through a mutual fund. Awesome. Sandeep? Yeah, because right now as we speak, I've got 100% money in gold, but uh, I intend to move 30% of my money in long-term debt uh, this month or next month and 30% in Indian equities. Awesome. Vineet, uh, how is your asset allocation thing? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, uh, I have uh, almost 70% uh, uh, right now into uh, debt, but uh, I, uh, you know, within equities, I would so sort of very strongly recommend uh, the mid caps and the small caps. Awesome. So I think the point that we wanted to bring about with this exercise is that asset allocation happens to be a personal decision as well. Uh, there is no uh, one answer to asset allocation. I think Kalpain has raised his hand. Kalpain, you are on mute. I think you mentioned what I wanted to say that it is a personal choice. Each person has to uniquely uh, decide that. And uh, you know, you heard some of us talking of gold mining, uh, but I, I just want all of you to be aware that this fund has reasonably high amount of volatility. We track it very closely. so. We have the appetite, but uh, don't invest in it only looking at past returns. Only invest in that fund under guidance or uh, with appropriate understanding. Yes, and I think uh, we have uh, always wanted to highlight risk to our investors upfront. So in that endeavor, I think these are all the questions. Needless to say, if you have more questions, you can reach out to us via Twitter DM. You can mail at services at dsvim.com. You can email any one of us personally. Uh, one more fact, I think a lot of people have asked this question on Skin in the Game. I have had the privilege to speaking all of our colleagues here uh, over you know, tea, coffee conversations. I can vouch that 100% of the investments happen to be in mutual funds. So most of uh, us have full skin in the game in DSP. Once you join DSP, you can only invest in DSP mutual funds. So we are investing in our in-house mutual funds and uh, we are together in this journey. So thank you for taking your time out this evening um, and we look forward to engaging with you in future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice weekend and uh, have a successful 2022. Good day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.